Labor Party power broker who put the environment on Australia's political agenda. Graham Richardson on working with Bob Hawke, Paul Keating and Kerry Packer. I've got to say about Kevin Wright there's that he is a remarkable human being. One thing's for sure, he's managed to poison so many things. When Hawke turned on the charm, uh, he could be an incredibly charming bloke. In our Canberra studio is Scott Morrison, the man who stopped the boats and is now going to stop who knows what. We'll find out. G'day, Graham. Well, Richo has been a familiar face here at Sky News for almost a decade. A former federal senator, his insight comes from working alongside two prime ministers, but he's also done his time in the private sector, advising and lobbying for the likes of the late Kerry Packer. Today he spars on live television alongside a man he often clashes with, Alan Jones. Now, over these years, he's had his share of battle scars as well. It is a great pleasure to have him on the program. Richard, welcome. Thank you, Chris. It's a pleasure now, to be here. It's good to have you here. How are you coping with this self-isolation, with this, you know, new wave of the way we live in 2020? Mate, I think um, anyone who's gregarious, and I think... Whatever you describe me as, you'd probably concede I was that, um, finds this very difficult because this is, you know, you're in solitude all the time and solitude is not my go. Um, I like to be out and about. I like to be in restaurants with, uh, with my friends and that, of course, is, is not on at the moment and won't be on for who knows how long. It's almost impossible to compare what we are witnessing and what we're experiencing to anything like it in our lifetime. I, I have not experienced anything that comes within a bull's roar of this. This is an extraordinary time in the world's history, uh, let alone the history of individuals like you and I. This is massive. I wonder what you think about where we're up to, though, because we've got almost a million unemployed. We're in the process of spending $320 billion. Uh, we've got single-figure infections almost every day in the last 12 days. Isn't it time we reopen? I think it's time that we, we at least began that process. Uh, and I think over the next couple of weeks, most things should reopen. Uh, we, we, I, I understand the, the government's caution. I'm not being critical. Um, but I do think that, that you have to be so aware of, of everything that's happening minute by minute here. As soon as the chance comes, you have to take it. Because the, you know, the, I don't know what will be left of the economy. No one does. Uh, and that's, got, that's a, a, a very big question. And I think we're, the best way to answer it is to get going. And so I, uh, I hope that we can do that very quickly. You know, it's interesting. We talk about the $42 billion that Kevin Rudd spent to try and get us through the GFC. That is just absolutely chicken feed to what we have experienced here. How do we ever make it up? I, look, it's a, it's a big question. I mean, I... Uh, what, what Kevin Rudd did, which we thought at the time, would, and I can tell you, even from within his government, was extraordinary. Uh, the reality is that's, that's lunch money compared to what we're doing here. I mean, what we're doing here is just so massive, it's beyond belief. I don't actually believe we can repay all this debt. Um, I think there's a lot of world debt going to have to be forgiven over the course of the next few decades because the debt that's been run up, most of which is held by China, of course, um, is just something we can't meet. But China will, will be able to use it in its soft power uh, efforts, I think, pretty well over the next few years. China is becoming more formidable, not less. And the nation that's given us the virus is now giving us the vaccine to fix the virus, giving us the masks, giving us all the, the equipment we need to fix it. I mean, it doesn't matter with, with China. They always seem to come out on top. I want to talk to you a little bit later in this program about how we dig ourselves out of this and get on the road to recovery and the kind of reform that we have to undertake. But just in terms of what you're seeing out there, Australians are very good at clubbing together and doing the right thing by their country, aren't they? Oh, yeah. I mean, I think this has been an amazing exercise, really, because, you know, we're, we're the larrikin individuals of the world. That's how we've painted ourselves. And yet, when, uh, when the crunch comes and we need to come together, we do it really, really well. And I think this has been a, a, a classic example of that. I don't think any nation in the world has, do, has done as well as we have. There, there may be some, but I, I'm not aware of them. We are, we are really good at this. It's been a pretty special time.
And what about the concept of national cabinet? It is a masterstroke, I thought, and, and to share the, the decision-making is a very clever thing politically too, right? It is indeed. I, I think um, uh, for, for Scott Morrison it means that uh, you know, he doesn't have to take the blame if something goes wrong. Everyone, every state premier has got to join with him in, in accepting some responsibility. Uh, but apart from that, uh, I don't think it's just a matter of, of um, if, if I can be uh, intemperate, ass covering. I think it's a bit more important than that. I think what, what we're seeing here is an opportunity for national cooperation that, that we can sp springboard off and use into the future. You know, I hope this body keeps meeting because the, the, the only thing it can do is good. It can't do us any harm. Now, your recent health dramas have been well publicised. Um, we've heard about them on Sky News. We've read about them. You seem to be uh, fighting fit at the moment, certainly not affecting your television style. Um, but take us back to 1965. And a lot of people mightn't be aware of this, but you were at death's door because of a car accident. What do you remember of that? Yeah, um, my, uh, my father uh, and I went for a drive and it was just near uh, the Tarrant Point Bridge in Sydney. Uh, he had a telegraph pole. No one knows why. Um, uh, we blacked out or whatever, no, no one knows, but he hit a telegraph pole. Now, I wasn't wearing a seatbelt, no one did in those days. No. And uh, so my head went through the windscreen, so that required 300 stitches in the face. And then uh, my torso uh, hit the dashboard, so I had a ruptured spleen and a ripped bowel, and I was in all sorts of strife. Jeez. Um, how long were you in hospital way, for? That was the first day of the leaving certificate in, uh, in 1965, uh, which was the last full leaving certificate, and I had to repeat. <laughs> so I had to go to a different school. I mean, it was a very, very disruptive period in my life. And what about the impact on your looks at the time? You were, you were a teenager. What, the, what, was, what was the impact when you took those bandages off? Well, I remember my best mate... Uh, uh, when, in, when my, he was there when they took the bandages off and he said, oh, shit. Um, and I think that summed it up. It was, it was pretty bad. Um, and, of course, uh, what you see is now, today, I had three operations on it uh, after that. And then, um, uh, obviously, I've had uh, a somewhat lengthy period um, to, uh, to get over it as well. So it, it doesn't look so bad now, but it looked pretty bad at the time. And, of course... That's the worst time for it to look bad. You know, you're, you're coming into contact with girls. Uh, you, you know, your, your social life is just really beginning. Yeah. And uh, for mine, it, uh, it, it really th threw a spanner in the works. I want to skip forward to your uh, senatorial days. So it's 11 years in the chamber and, of course, working under the likes of Bob Hawke and, and Paul Keating. Um, what were they like to work with? They were very different personalities, but what were they like to work with? Well, I, I, uh, I, I think uh, Hawke and I worked together incredibly well. We were very good mates. I think that's what um, uh, helped so much. You know, he and I, I'd been his driver in early campaigns in 72 and 74, and so I'd got to know him um, really well. And uh, there wasn't much about him I didn't know. And so Hawke and I be, were pretty good mates, so working with him was, was always very easy. Uh, Keating and I had... Uh, plenty of arguments uh, and some periods of estrangement. But somehow, to this day, uh, the friendship has survived pretty much intact and, uh, and Paul and I are fine. Uh, I mean, Keating had the highest IQ, I think, of anyone I ever met in politics. I don't think I ever saw anyone as bright as Paul. He had an amazing mind. Uh, and, uh, you know, the... He, he could use words like swords. They could just cut you apart. Uh, Keating was a pretty special individual. We keep thinking about what we need to do in terms of reform in this country. If we could get halfway to the kind of reform that both those men achieved in their time, we'd be going in the right direction, would we not? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, when you think about it, Chris, um, you know, in the first few days... After we were elected, uh, we floated the dollar. That was a massive decision, mm. you know. That was huge at the time. And that was done immediately. Now, you know, not many governments do that, you know. Just, we just we hit the road running. Uh, and, and I think, um, 
you know, you've just got to give Hawke and Keating an enormous amount of credit for that. They dragged Australia forward because, unfortunately, during the Fraser years, um, nothing was done. Mm. You know, Fraser, I, I, I think if, if we're looking at it, it has to be the worst Prime Minister ever because if, if, if he's got to stand up and say, here is my legacy, what would it be? Mm. Um, just going back on to Bob Hawke, you should take the credit for basically introducing Australians to the environmental protection era. And you had a little bit of a struggle with your boss, Bob Hawke. You had to basically force him and introduce him to what counted out there in, um, you know, out there in the mob. The mob cared for the environment. You could sense that. But you had to convince Bob Hawke of that. Am I right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it, uh, it, it was a, a new thing then, um, caring about the environment. It, it hadn't been a, a feature of Australian politics. Uh, and then suddenly um, it, it became a feature. I'd like to think I've, I made it more of a feature myself because I, I campaigned on it really hard. Mm. And issues like the Franklin had, for the first time, had national effects and people, you know, right around the world, right around Australia, I should say, had an opinion on, on, on what was happening with the environment. Everybody had an opinion. It became a, a really big talking point. And um, I think it needed to be, to be capitalised on. We needed to show people that we were listening. And if you were listening, you knew you had to do something uh, about the environment because so many things were going wrong so quickly. And Hawkey didn't want to go to Tasmania when this was starting to build, and you forced him to go, didn't you? Yeah, I, I did. Um, he, well, because I, I knew how big this was, and I knew he needed to be part of it, and uh, he didn't quite see the need originally. But as always with Hawkey, if you presented a good argument, uh, and then I took him down and showed him what I, what I was talking about, uh, then he was always on board. And then you went off to Ravenshoe. I remember this uh, like it was only yesterday. They wanted to lynch you then, didn't they? Yeah, that, that was pretty vicious. Um, I mean, look, you know, when you take livelihoods away and um, by that stage the industry wasn't anything like it had been over time, it was only down to less than 300 workers. But still, those 300 workers didn't only have a job they had a history, they had a lifestyle, um, and, and that was what you were taking away from them. Their, their antecedents had all done this. You know, this, this was just... The, every inch of them was about the forest, and you take that away and, you know, obviously people get angry. Now, when we produced plenty of jobs in, in looking after the place, and uh, in the end, a lot of that dissipated, uh, so that I was able to go back a year later and have a beer in the pub at Ravenshoe without being lynched. Well, when you first went there and they did want to lynch you, uh, if it weren't for a burly copper, that might have happened. Yeah, one policeman had an attack of conscience. Uh, they'd all been instructed by Jockey Peterson to just sit back. But just one guy, he knew that he had to do something. He couldn't let it go. And uh, he came in and he, uh, he... I remember he got to the biggest guy and he said, if... If you don't pull, pull back, someone's going to get hurt. And then he looked at him and he said, it'll be effing you. <laughs> and um, uh, the, the big guy decided he didn't want to take that on. So uh, uh, he, he, he just, it just caused that moment of hesitation which enabled us to rush to the car and, and get in and drive away. And I said, but it was a very heated, very nasty moment. And I don't mind telling you... Was I scared? Absolutely, I was terrified <laughs> at the time. It was pretty scary. I mean, if you've got 300 to 1, mate, these are not odds you crave, you know. <laughs> We've seen our fair share of leadership spills in recent... Well, in the recent decade. Um, but going back when you had to push for Paul Keating to take over the leadership, you had to show your loyalty to Keating and all of a sudden you were trying to convince Bob Hawke that the time was up. Did you feel any sense of disloyalty? How aggro did Hawke get to you? Uh, did it create a gulf in your relationship that would last? It, it, it created a, a problem for us um, that we papered over but never got over uh, so that 
our relationship afterwards was always civil, um, but it never had the same warmth. Um, look, I thought Hawkey was, was just marvellous, but by the same token, Chris, has to be remembered, Mr 72% was Mr 27%. Mm. Things were in a, in a hell, hell of a muddle and we were headed out the door. And we were also, uh, in my, my mind, just drifting towards defeat. And the one thing about me is if I'm going to go down, I'm going to go down fighting. I, I never just, just <laughs> lay down my arms and say, OK, I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm quitting. I don't do that. And uh, I wanted to go down fighting. And if that, was, if that meant having Paul Keating, remember 83% of people disapproved of him at the time we appointed him. Um, and yet there we were. We, you know, we fought and we won. Mm. Uh, a real risk at the time, but you did make the right decision. I, I wonder how you got on with Kerry Packer. I've spoken to you about this privately. Um, he saw you not only as an advisor, someone who could get him in the door of power uh, and fix things, but he also saw you as a mate. And there would be times that you've told me where he would invite you to places where it wasn't about business. He wanted to have a yak. Is that true? Oh, yeah, um, almost daily. Um, he'd just ring up and talk to me for three or four hours. He'd, he'd get me to come over. Um, I, we'd talk through my lunch. I'd have to cancel that. And, and he'd just talk on. Um, and, of course, that was an enormous privilege. Um, I, I got to know Kerry better than almost anyone, I guess. And the one thing about him, he's an extraordinary man. You know, whether, you th whether you're a fan or you're not, doesn't change the fact that he was an extraordinary man. There was a presence about him. When he walked into a room, everybody knew it. It was that combination of that big... So, you know, he was a big man. Mm. But apart from that, he had a big intellect, he had a big voice, and he had a heart as big as Australia. He, he was a, a courageous man, a good man. Were you still prepared to have a constructive, you know, vocal argument with him when you knew he was wrong? Oh, yeah. I, I think I was one of the... Well, well, you know, there were a couple, I think, but not many of us ever really did. A lot of people said, I, you know, well, oh, I told Kerry. That was largely nonsense. Um, Kerry and I had some huge arguments. Uh, at one stage, he didn't talk to me for nine months. <laughs> nine <laughs> months. <laughs> Kept paying me, right? <laughs> Kept paying me. Didn't talk to me for nine months, and then... Uh, Carol, his, uh, his secretary, simply rang up one day and said, Mr Packer, we'd like to have lunch with you. I said, oh, OK, good. So <laughs> I turned up. Uh, no one mentioned the war. <laughs> it just continued as if that nine months had never happened. Uh, that was Kerry. He, it, was, it was his way of saying sorry. Um, it was as close as you could ever get him to doing that. And then you were the last person to see him alive. That must have been a, a very special moment for you, Richard. Yeah, outside of uh, the family, um, uh, I saw him uh, and it was, uh, it was a tragic moment. Uh, he just he decided he would take uh, no more treatment and um, I can understand that because, as you know, the, uh, the treatment for people with bad kidneys isn't easy or pleasant. Mm. He'd had enough of it over uh, so many years. And uh, I, I was begging him to, to take more, but he, but he wouldn't. And, um, you know, it, I, I just will never forget that moment because when I left, he, he said, I'll see you out. And I said, well, don't be silly, mate. I'm, I'm big enough and ugly enough I can find the door. And he said, no, I'll effing see you out. And he, he got up and he shuffled to the door. It was only about 30 feet or so, but he shuffled. He could hardly walk. But such was the pride in the man. He was determined... Uh, to stand and see me out, um, and that's the that's the image I have, the the memory I have of uh, of my friend Kerry Packer.